Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Azrin here, owner of the Calgary Language Nerds, and welcome to today's YouTube video and, of course, podcast episode. I'm back in Calgary now, which I am feeling, honestly, I would say mixed. I feel mixed emotions about it. On one hand, I'm excited to be back. I'm happy to be back. I get to see my family, get to see my friends. I truly have gone back to um, a much more Canadian lifestyle meaning the way I'm spending my time now is much more similar to how I usually would spend my time. Whereas in Taiwan, I had a, I suppose, a different lifestyle. I didn't spend my time in the same way that I typically would here in Calgary. I will say that one of the reasons why I live abroad one to two months a year, and I have literally for the past 15 or 16 years, one reason I do it aside from wanting to learn languages is quite simply that when I go live abroad for one or two months of the year, my routines all change. And I learn a lot about myself that I can then bring back to my to my Canadian, my Canadian life. So I have already made some changes in my day to day life, um, based on the experience that I had while I was in Taiwan. I, um, I do think that at some point in the near future, I'm going to talk about some of these changes, because some of them uh, are related to my professional uh, my professional life. And that obviously does impact all the language work that I do. But we can leave that for another another day. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about a question I received from a previous Calgary language nerd student. In fact, this was the very first German student that the Calgary language nerds, my business ever had. And he took he has taken classes for a number of years now, I want to say three years or so. And essentially, he takes classes, takes a break, takes classes, takes a break. And yes, so he sent in a question here, and I want to talk about it. Essentially, this student, his name is Brandon. Um, Brandon has sent me an email here, and he's asked me if I know anyone who has tried a language learning approach, which is called automatic language growth. He also sent me a video, which I will uh, put a link to in the description of today's video slash podcast episode. The video essentially gives a breakdown, a general breakdown of this automatic language growth method. Now, the first thing I do want to say before I get too far into this episode is that I'm not exactly an expert on the automatic language growth method. What I have done is I've opened up their website. I've read through the um, the page on their website, which talks about their approach. And I've watched the video that Brandon sent me. And from what I can tell, from what I can tell, this is an approach that relies heavily upon language acquisition, and not so much on conscious learning. So depending on how deep you got into um, language learning methods and content, you may or may not already know that there are certain methods of learning a language that are much more learning oriented, meaning you consciously try to make your brain learn another language. And there are other methods that are much more acquisition style methods. And these are methods where you naturally, quote unquote, acquire whatever language you're trying to learn, where your brain, in a sense, naturally absorbs the language. And it's not so much a conscious learning process where you're trying to force, quote unquote, your brain to learn. And the automatic language automatic language growth method based on their the video that I watched um, and based on the the uh, one page on the website seems like it seems like they're relying heavily more quite heavily on a more acquisition style of approach, particularly around based around comprehensible input. So I did make a video and a podcast about this quite recently. If you go to Azrin the language nerd dot com slash top dash tips that's a z or z r e n the language nerd dot com slash top dash tips you're going to see a, a video or video and audio podcast both on that page that talks about comprehensible input so i've gone quite deep into it comprehensible input essentially is listening to content that you understand despite the fact that you might you don't understand all the words that are being said you understand them enough of it through gestures, through context, through even the words that they're using, um, visuals, and you're able to understand the message, even though you might not understand all the words. That's in a very simple terms, compre comprehensible input. 
And the theory is that by listening to a lot of comprehensible input, particularly if it's interesting to you, your brain will start to naturally acquire the language. So the automatic language growth method, from what I can tell, is relying heavily upon taking the theory of comprehensible input and applying it in a, in a classroom setting, in a setting where you can actually learn by taking classes, right? Whether it's private or group, whatever it is. <clears throat> and you can use that as a, as a method for learning whatever language you're trying to learn. So for them, it looks like Thai. Thai is the language for automatic language growth. Thai is the language that they've they've applied all these um these methods essentially to okay so a, a, a couple of comments that i want to share that come to mind when i was looking through looking through the automatic language growth program and also just my thoughts on acquiring a language primarily through through comprehensible input well the first thing i want to say is that it's it's in my experience and this is after having taught or known as fellow learners literally thousands of people over the years that have tried to learn or are learning or who have learned languages for the vast majority what i've been able to tell for many of them maybe even the majority it would be hard for them to let go of conscious of the idea of consciously learning another language and i do think i, I think that's something we have to actually take into account it's something we have to take into account. It's like if you told someone, you know, I'm not sure if this is the right analogy, but it's the one that comes to mind right now. It's like if you told someone who was nervous about something, maybe they've got a, a fear of something that is irrational, something they don't necessarily need to be scared of. Like me having a fear of water for most of my life that I've only overcome probably in my adult years. If you told me, as when I was much younger, as a child, let's say, if you told me, hey, Azrin, look, it's water, but you're going to be safe. You're with this lifeguard or you're with a swim instructor. We're going to hold you, this, that, the other thing. There are no sharks and alligators in swimming pools, because I believe that there were. There are no sharks. There are no alligators. No matter what you told me, no matter how much rationalization you did, I would not have been able to let go of my fear of the swimming pool. It really was a fear of the swimming pool as a child anyway. It wasn't so much the water, it was the water in a pool format really. But I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have been able to let that go. Even though the right answer is to let it go, I wouldn't have been able to. Does that make sense? So I think we do have to take into account that a lot of people the way they think, the way they've learned things in the past, th their DNA, who knows where it comes from, the concept of letting go and trusting the process of your brain naturally acquiring something. I don't, I, I, I think there are certain people that would struggle to do that. Maybe that's what they have to do anyway. I don't know. But at least we have to take that into account that there'd be people who would struggle with it. So that's, that's number one. Number two is this, um, I do think, I, I could be super wrong about this, but I'm, just, I'm still gonna say it. This might be wrong, but I wanna say it because it's in my head. You know, there are people that I can think of that I, that I know personally who are learning languages right now or who have learned languages in the past. And these are people that even if slash when they are in these, these ideal comprehensible input environments, Somehow or another, here's the way to put it. Sorry, I'm, I'm fumbling over my words a bit. Here's maybe the way to put it. It's something like this. Um, there are some people that their brains naturally start to make connections to another language. They naturally start to make connections to say, oh, this is how that works. Oh, this is how I say this. Oh, this is the word. These are the words that have to come out of my mouth. And there are other people I've met that it, it doesn't come to them quite as quickly. And no matter how much you try to teach them through acquisition, it doesn't seem to really stick. And when you teach them through some actual conscious teaching methods, it actually seems to stick and it works. And suddenly they can actually speak. Whereas if you, when you tried the acquisition methods, it wasn't working. Now, you can make the argument that, oh, you didn't try for long enough. 
You could have tried the acquisition methods for longer and they would have picked it up. That's an argument you could make, fair enough. You could make the argument that those people were not truly de dealing with the material that was at the right level, perhaps. Um, but I do want to say, just based on what I've seen, and again, I could be super wrong about this. And so if you want to correct me or if you've got thoughts, like let me know. I'm more than happy to hear your thoughts. But what I'm thinking is there are certain people that with a little bit of conscious teaching, conscious learning, where you say, hey, this is how the grammar point actually works. This is how this works. This is how, this is the rule. These are the buckets, blah, blah, blah. When you do that, there are some people, maybe even a lot of people that are going to, that's going to help them learn. It will help them learn. And, you know, I can give personal examples for that where, you know, a great example for me, I've used this example before is, is, is the subjunctive in, in French. I was using the subjunctive myself frequently. I heard people use it often. I had learned this French subjunctive through an acquisition style of learning. I'd done it and I, I, I could do it. I understood it. I couldn't have explained to you what the heck I was doing. That's for sure. But I could do it. But let me tell you, the second someone taught me, after I'd acquired it, someone taught me the rules, it, it, it sunk way deeper into my brain. And now I could use it I could use it with verbs that maybe I wouldn't have ever used before. Meaning, not to say that I couldn't have used a subjunctive with those verbs, right? I couldn't have used it with X, Y, Z verbs that that I didn't use it with. It's not that I couldn't, but I wouldn't for one reason or another. But the moment it was taught, it was almost like something had come together in my brain. And now, now that I knew the rule, if I ever had an unfamiliar verb, not even unfamiliar, a verb that I'd never use a subjunctive with, instead of relying on an intuition that I was unsure was right or wrong, I could back it up by knowing, oh, actually, that is the rule, and my intuition says this, so that's the way to go. Which brings me to my next point. A lot of people I meet that learn through more acquisition style, a more acquisition style of learning, one thing that I've seen them be plagued by is this idea they have this idea this idea that they don't speak the language correctly they have an idea that they don't that they're making a lot of mistakes essentially that they're not even though they're speaking they're everyone's understanding them and they understand what people say to them and they're communicating they're very fluent they have this nagging thought in their head that goes i don't know if anything i'm doing is right or wrong i don't know maybe they're understanding me but i'm making mistakes left right and center and they feel very self-conscious and it bugs them. It bugs them and it hurts their self-confidence in the language, which in turn helps their, which in turn hinders their proficiency and fluency and overall level. So with people like that, I have found it's actually very helpful to go back almost to like the level 1.1 of all grammar and to work, work with them systematically through the language um, in a very traditional style, I suppose you can say, traditional classroom style of fashion. And it's incredibly helpful for them. It's very helpful for them. Um, you know, I have per I've had personal experience with that. I've seen it with lots of people. Um, and so that is also something I believe needs to be taken into account. Um, last but not least, and there's more that I can say on this, but this is the last thing that I think comes to mind for the time being. Um, last but not least, we also have to take into account that, that, and you can probably relate to this if you try to learn through comprehensible input style of learning, it's hard for many people and particular for a lot of languages too. It's difficult to find the right resources to create the perfect acquisition environment where you just learn the language in this way and you naturally absorb it. It's incredibly difficult to create such an environment, particularly for some languages where maybe there aren't that many resources to learn it. Um, or maybe even, you know, maybe even a more popular language, quote unquote popular, like French or Spanish or English, like maybe in theory, there are resources and you could create such an environment. But even creating such an environment is a skill. It's a skill to be able to do that, right? And then not to say you should, not to say don't learn it. That's not what I'm saying. It's just, it's something to take into account and literally... If you're spending four hours a week learning the language, you might decide that you're going to implement a method that is less optimal than what 
you maybe should be doing because that's just the decision that you made and it still works out, right? That's the thing. I think it's not an all or nothing game. If you're not using an acquisition style of learning, you know, maybe it's less than ideal. Yeah, possibly you might be right about that, but it doesn't mean you can't learn a language using other methods and other, other types of strategies that again, might be less than ideal, but you don't need to always strive for the ideal to learn a language. You don't need to less than ideal works quite well. <laughs> good. You don't need great. You, you just good is good and is more than good enough. Good is great in many ways um, when trying to learn a language. So as a summary, um, how do I summarize all that? I don't really know how to summarize all, all that. I guess it's something like this. It's something like, I don't know about automatic language growth, if it works, if it doesn't work. I don't know. I haven't taken their classes. I have no idea. But it seems like the concepts that they're relying the program on are quite sound. They seem to be sound concepts. And you definitely could, and maybe even perhaps even should, uh, design a good, strong curriculum program around acquisition style of teaching and learning methods. That's for sure. Um, as a general whole, when you look at acquisition styles of acquisition strategies to try to learn a language, I mean, I think they can be very effective, but this isn't a, we, we can't have a closed-minded discussion to say, this is how to learn a language. This is all that works. Everything else is wrong. No, don't do that. No, no, no. This is all you have to do. It's so simple. Just let go and learn and let your brain. No, I, maybe in theory things, maybe in theory it's that simple, but here's the thing. Everything in theory is that simple. A, not everything. Many things in life, in theory, are very simple, but in practicality, get very messy. And I think that's a great place to wrap up today's podcast episode and, of course, YouTube video. Thank you for watching slash listening. I appreciate your attention as always, and um, we'll chat soon. See ya.